Over the past few months, my, my job has mostly been to defend the transatlantic partnership and the TTIP. Um, but from discussions and, and from the public debate, I get the impression that it, that it is rather a U.S.-Germany free trade agreement than a U.S.-EU free trade agreement. So that's why I'm asking, where come the EU member states into place in this discussion? What, how would the transatlantic space really change if we had a successful detail within the next year? Or on the other side, what would be the danger, what would, what would be the political repercussions of a failure of negotiations? Whenever I try to figure out what could be a big project to intensify and to revitalize these transatlantic relations again, uh, then it's TTIP. So in my eyes, TTIP is a unique chance to define a global set of standards, um, how to shape the globalization. And I'm very much scared that for the time being, the opponents, not only in Germany, but in some neighborhood countries as well, um, uh, well, put a conclusion or a finalization of the agreement so much in peril, as it appears to me. Because this would not only be a, a big disadvantage in terms of trade and investment, which should be improved, and the access, a mutual access to all our, our markets, uh, and to set some standards, which could be a blueprint for other trade and investment uh, agreements all over the world, whenever you have a look on the fact that uh, these two continents generate about, about 50% of our GDP, global GDP. But it would be even more. TTIP, in my eyes, is in the meantime a strategic issue between the United States and Europe against the background of the current crisis we are facing. So it's even more than only a trade and investment agreement. First of all, let me say that I can announce today the fact that just a few hours ago we have finally reached a consensus on the declassification of the mandate, which is a very important thing. Why? Because in the mandate you find all the red lines and the objective of the negotiation, which means that we can use the mandate in order to defeat the myth and the fears that are all around Europe, not only Germany, I can assure you, about the contents of this negotiation. And I would say that behind this, this myth, there is a lot of anti-Americanism. I have to say very straightforward, because uh, some of the issues that are raised are completely without sense. Let me make some examples. Public services. One of the myths is that we're going to uh, change our approach toward public services to private services. Public services are excluded uh, on any negotiation that the EU uh, is carrying on. It's a rule. Second, uh, OGM, uh, GMOs, sorry. Uh, we're going to uh, 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 leave GMOs entering to, uh, into Europe without control. This is excluded in the mandate. And, and many other uh, threats that are only in the mind of people that wants the transatlantic relation to be weaker. Well, I think, first of all, I think we should stop having uh, perhaps so much doom and gloom about the transatlantic economic relationship, because I think one of the things that we, we miss in the discussion and in the debates, and I agree 100 percent with all of the previous speakers, we have a lot of myths that we have to bust here. One of the things we miss is that we're already the most dynamic trading and investment relation, relationship in the world. I mean, we have 13 million people on both sides of the Atlantic who owe their jobs to transatlantic economic relations. We've got $4 trillion invested in each other's economies. So all these things we hear about, oh, you know, we've got all these differences between us. I worked for 26 years as an economic officer in the State Department, mostly in China and the former Soviet Union. And if you think there's that many differences between us, you A, you're not looking at the statistics, and B, you have not traveled enough, because there really aren't. Investor state dispute settlement. It's a concept, actually, which was uh, founded in Germany in 1959. It's used in bilateral investment treaties. The goal is pretty simple, as in you know, many of the trade discussions we're having. I mean, the, the goals are simple. The devil is always in the details. 
So, I mean, the goal is to protect our investors overseas from discriminatory behavior or from uh, pure theft, essentially, from having their investments taken from them. Germany has 131 of these agreements. The U.S. is 47. We haven't really had any since 1980. Germany started in 1959. Thank you, Germany. You started it. But we think it's actually, it actually makes sense. So why don't we work together to try to make something that is standard better? And that's what TTIP's about. We're trying to make general global standards and norms better. And we've got the highest standards and norms hands down in the world. Uh, a lot of myths involving our standards, which we, would, uh, which we disagree with. Some of our standards are higher than yours, some of yours are higher than ours, but they're all world-class standards. So that's one of the myths we try to debunk. I do also believe that this is really a once-in-a-lifetime chance. And it will not return as we live. And it will our damage, especially the European economies, if TTIP fails in a way that they will be not able to recover. And if we see the huge challenges for European economies, the demographics, the, um, uh, comp uh, 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 the competition from the uh, Asia Pacific region, and still the sovereign debts, then there's only one thing that you really need to overcome this beside all the other measures, and this is competitiveness. If we all agree that this is necessary, it is strategically important that mistakes have been done in order to sell it to the public, that leadership is an, is an issue, what has to be done in the next 12 to 15 months? In my eyes, really, I'm, I'm, in my eyes it's really ridiculous that uh, some medias in Germany uh, reduced the discussion about or, or on TTIP uh, to chlorinated chickens. What is a crucial principle of all free trade agreement is the single undertaking principle, which means that until you have closed everything, you haven't closed anything. So you have to close all the issues before it's concluded. It's one shot. Let's put it this way. Now, the problem with this is that if you are not delivering, you are not delivering at all, which is something that, in my opinion, we cannot allow to happen. So, what I'm suggesting here is that given the fact that the TTIP will always be a living agreement, this means that even if we close what, I mean, a very comprehensive agreement right now, there will always be chapters that we want to add to the agreement. Let's take the things that we know where we can reach an agreement easily. Then we have on the non-tariff barrier, barriers six sectors, uh, and the automotive is one of, of, of these sectors, that have already reached an agreement about what they want. So I don't see why we should wait and, and discuss any longer. Let's take what they want. <coughs> uh, they reach the agreement between industry and put in the, in the scheme of, of the agreement. Now, this interim agreement will not prevent us to negotiate other things, but I'm ready to vote in favor of an interim agreement without geographical indication, if it's interim. Because I know that then, over a period of time, we will be able to find a compromise when the issues will be mature. But at the same time, we will be able to deliver. And people will see there are no monsters behind, behind the TTAP. If we instead continue to go ahead for the overall agreements with all, you know, the, 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 the mechanism of the comprehensiveness in your side of the playing field, we, I'm more than sure that we will not conclude.